introducing two of the best interviewers in our business, Cara Swisher and Jorge Ramos, who will sit down for a conversation. Buckle your seatbelts. Cara is the co-founder and editor-at-large of Recode, and this conversation, including the questions we hope you'll ask, will be recorded for her podcast. A former reporter in the Wall Street Journal San Francisco office, Cara is a legendary technology journalist, one of the first in the business. She is co-executive producer of the country's premier conference on tech and media, the Code Conference, where she has interviewed tech leaders from Bill Gates to Mark Zuckerberg and Jeff Bezos. Today, she is sitting down with another journalistic legend, Univision news anchorman Jorge Ramos. He is a household name to anyone who watches news in Spanish, and he is a hero to so many journalists who have just admired how he asked the toughest questions and is fearless at all times. His newscast attracts 2 million viewers nightly in the United States and 13 Latin American countries. And his sad Sunday morning political show attracts another 1 million viewers. He also writes a weekly column distributed by the New York Times Syndicate to more than 40 newspapers in the United States and Latin America. Jorge is a proud immigrant, having come to the United States from Mexico as a student in 1983. He has interviewed world leaders from George Bush to Barack Obama to Fidel Castro. He has authored 13 books received the Walter Cronkite Award for Excellence in Political Journalism for advancing the conversation about what divides us as a country. Please join me in welcoming Jorge and Cara. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. How's it going? So we want to do um, a lot of questions, because I assume you all have a lot of questions. So I'm going to start. We're going to have a conversation. We'll have a conversation. Um, and then ask the first question. Yes, I will. I shall <laughs> ask the first question. But just so you know, two things. Um, I left my phone in uh, the car uh, on the way here this morning. I came in from DC, and I haven't been without a cell phone since 1996 or so. So I'm a little bit jumpy. Um, it's the, it's the best relationship I've ever had, obviously, so it's hard being away from her. Um, anyway, so, so... So, you know, before we start, it, it is difficult to be on the other side because we've been interviewers for right, such a exactly. long time. And they say, well, it's going to be a great conversation. Well, I'm not sure about that. Yeah, yeah, fine. <laughs> uh, someone... I'm so sorry in advance. Um, all right, so uh, let's talk a little bit about Trump then. Let's start there. Uh -huh. um, so it's been My friend. Not, your, your close friend, Donald Trump. Um, let's talk about that incident and what the repercussions were. Because I want to talk about, there's a lot of things. We could go to Cuba and Bernie Sanders. We could talk about disinformation. We could talk about Russia uh, and disinformation. But let's start with that, which really sort of was a great moment, not a good moment, but a big mm -hmm. moment in the relationship between uh, the press and the government and politics and social media, everything around it. Can you talk a little bit about the repercussions? I, I think that that we, and when, when I say we uh, Latinos, we saw something and we sent something that many people didn't want to see. When he said, um, after going down the stairs and, and announcing that he wanted to be president, when he said that Mexican immigrants were criminals and rapists, he was talking about me. I'm a Mexican immigrant. And so I did what you would have done. Mm -hmm. I, I sent him a, a letter to mm -hmm. his office in, in New York, mm -hmm. uh, FedEx, and he got it. And instead of just responding, no, I don't want to do an interview with you, I told him that I wanted to talk to him. Mm -hmm. I had many questions. So instead of doing that, he published the letter on, on Instagram and with my phone number on it. So I had to change my phone, obviously. That number, I clearly didn't like it. Mm -hmm. and, and I said, well, now it's my turn. So I was looking for the right moment to confront Donald Trump, mm -hmm. just to tell him what you said about Mexican immigrants was racist. 
it was wrong, and as a journalist, I have the right to ask you a question. So uh, how many people, how many of you have gone to Dubuque, Iowa? Yeah, that, that, that's what, yeah, just a few. Well, so we found that he was gonna give a press conference in Dubuque, Iowa, not in New York, because it would have been with uh, thousands of journalists. And then in Dubuque, um, I was sitting on the front row, and then as, as you would have done in any press mm -hmm. conference, I saw a moment of silence, less than a second. I stood up and I said, I have a question. I have a question about immigration. And he just didn't want to, he just didn't want to answer. He told me, go back to Univision. Basically, he was saying, uh, go back to Mexico. That's mm -hmm. exactly what he meant. Another racist comment. And instead of answering the question, his bodyguard took me out of that press conference. The only other person that has done something similar, it was Fidel Castro with his bodyguards. Mm -hmm. so, so that's what happened. What, there was immediate repercussions, speaking of using Instagram and social media across social media when this happened. Mm -hmm. What was the result from your point of view? What do you think it, it did for good and not so good? As, as we were saying, everything is public now. Mm -hmm. and, and with social media, now we just didn't, didn't have to wait for the newscast mm -hmm. at 6.30 to find out exactly what was happening. Um, he, he was a master, and he's still a master of, of using social media for his own purposes. Mm -hmm. and, but on the other hand, I think there's a lot of resistance to that. So uh, the fact that he published my, my phone number on, on Instagram, mm -hmm. and that everybody knows that number, everybody knew that number, and I got all kinds of messages from, from people uh, telling me... Um, that we were doing exactly what, what we needed to do to mm -hmm. people asking for, for a job and even sending some songs to me. Okay, all right. <laughs> There's a plus side to everything, it I was, guess. Yeah, it, so not everything was negative. Yeah, so being trolled by Donald Trump has its advantages, I guess. Um, all right, so um, when, when, when that happened, the relationship, it sort of began something that happened over and over again. And it's all swirling around in a more system, systemic mm -hmm. way around disinformation, around telling lies, around uh, uh, saying them in public, sort of telling lies in public and continuing them. Um, that continues to today. When I was leaving the hotel room today, uh, there was a, a, a headline on CNN that said, um, Donald Trump won't talk, won't say if he thinks Russia has been involved in these elections. Mm -hmm. Just won't say it or won't say it. And, and on the weekend, the national security advisor uh, was saying he had never seen analysis about the Russians being involved, which is, a lie, because there is, well, he may not have seen it, that may be, he may be partially telling the truth. He, he, he lies a lot, and, and we saw something that, that people just didn't want to pay attention to. We were saying, we know what's happening. On that day in, in Dubuque, Iowa, mm -hmm. um, he just made another racist statement. He attacked the, um, the press in ways in which I never expected, and he kept on lying. Uh, he, he said, for instance, that, I had, that he didn't know who I was then. If he didn't know who I was, how come he said, go back to Univision? Mm -hmm. So the fact that he was lying, and he has lied more than 2,000 times, according to the Washington Post, right? 15,000, but go ahead. Okay. Who's counting? <laughs> All right. Um, and the fact that he was attacking the press right there, and the fact that he was making racist statements, and then many journalists uh, and many people in the United States didn't want to see that. They would say, oh, Jorge, come on, you're, you're a Latino, maybe you're too sensitive, you don't know exactly who, who he is, he's not going to be here for long, and we were right. We were absolutely so right what, from the beginning. how has that affected your job? I want to get beyond Trump, because everyone sure. always just talks about what, what is, because it, it's been copied by a lot of people, and a lot of people are using social media to bypass reporters and mm -hmm. journalists and to tell their stories on their own, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but what, how does it affect your job? Because you had a point of view, you know, early yeah. on, everyone's like, uh, he shouldn't have a point of view. I heard that from some people. Now, just the other day, we had Anderson Cooper calling bullshit on a governor who was, yeah. uh, and he used that exact word on the it. air. Mm -hmm. Talk about the idea of point of view and storytelling today. As, as a journalist, I think we have two, two responsibilities, two very important responsibilities. The first one is to report reality as it is, not as we wish it would be. So if it's red, I have to say red. And then if 15 people died, we have to say 15. That's the most important responsibility. And I'm, I'm sure that people from Africa, Europe, and Asia, and, and Latin America can cover a hurricane more or less the same way, and even a war more or less the same way. But, but then the other important responsibility, probably the most important responsibility that we have, is to question 
those who are in power. Mm -hmm. And if we don't ask the top questions to those who are in power, nobody will. And then I think that we have to take a stand on six, on six different circumstances. When it comes to racism, discrimination, corruption, public lies, violation of human rights and dictatorships, we have to take a stand, Cara. And if we don't do that, then who's going to do it? That's, that's uh, engineers built incredible structures, architects built beautiful homes, uh, doctors saves lives, and we ask questions. And if we don't do that, who's going to do it? So what does that affect, um, you know, it's something you, I, you, you, you I, I do You've done the same the way. You do, do that all the time. time. And our, our relationship with power has to be confrontational sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a beautiful word in Spanish, um, contrapoder. Mm -hmm. And contrapoder means uh, to be on the other side of power. It doesn't matter who is in power. Mm -hmm. and, and people might say, well, Jorge, you are against Donald Trump. Well, just ask what happened with Barack Obama mm -hmm. before he left office. I confronted him and told him that he had deported more than three million people, more, more immigrants than any other president in the history of the United States. We're talking about removals. And he just didn't like it. And I, I haven't been able to talk to him again. Mm -hmm. So uh, same, I had the same experience with him. Um, I was talking about encryption, actually. And what happened? He didn't like it. He didn't. Have you talked to him again? Um, oddly enough, I, I, I'm going to tell a very short story. My ex-wife worked uh, at, for Barack uh, Obama in the yeah. White House, and at the end of your term, you're supposed to go in and take pictures with the family, and you, you stand in a line. It's very strange. Mm -hmm. And I, she made me go because the kids were there. And I walked into the Oval Office, and I was like, I really don't want to do this. And he looked at me. He said, how did you get in here? Um, so <laughs> Was he kidding or not? I don't know. No, no. <laughs> I, there, there was no Secret Service action, yeah. so I feel uh -huh. like it was a joke, but I, I could not tell because I asked him a tough question about encryption and um, how he changed his point of view. But, it, it, but when you talk about that, do you think that, that because reporters had always tried to be, uh, and I hate to use this term, fair and balanced. They tried yeah. to have that. I never thought that was the correct way to do it because I think you can do reported analysis of, of things. Like you do enough reporting and then you can have a point of view and call something out. And in, in certain occasions, you have to have a point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, once I had the opportunity, I wouldn't say it was an interview, with, with Fidel Castro. Uh, he was in Guadalajara. He was going from one uh, room to another in, in a hotel and I... I stop and I ask him some questions, and at the end, his bodyguard pushed me aside, and I couldn't continue the, the conversation. But here's, here's the, the way I see it. Should I interview Fidel Castro, or should I interview Nicolás Maduro, the dictator of Venezuela, the same way that I interview uh, a victim of their dictatorships? No, I think it's completely different. The approach that I have with someone who is in power is different than my approach with those who don't have power. And I don't know if you see it exactly the same way. I mean, mm -hmm. when you talk with all the, uh, these leaders in Silicon Valley, how do you do it? Well, there's no downside to insulting a billionaire, I've found, in my <laughs> career. Um, there really isn't. You look good, they never do. And then especially when it's Facebook, it doesn't really matter. You, it's, you win every time. Um, I'm and, like and the they, house. And, I'm like the house in Vegas. And you have to ask the questions. They are expecting yes. just because they have power yes. that you have to be soft. And that's not the way it should be. I think well, it has to be exactly the it's opposite. In, it's interesting. In politics, you get a lot more pushback. And you got some really ugly pushback from Donald Trump. I get sort of these sad-eyed looks like, how can you insult me? I'm a victim here. Um, I've made my billions, honestly, and you shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't question the damage. And I'm, help, I'm helping humanity. Right, I'm uh, helping humanity. So it's invention. a little different because you get a sort of a sad-eyed look from a man, a, a young white man in a T-shirt and uh, a hoodie, I, which who I have no sympathy for, but um, it's a different experience. Um, in any but case, still, still. yes, yes, you have to ask them the question. So let's get to that idea of the, the power of social media because here is, we have entered in a time, and I think, I don't think Donald Trump is, just the way JFK was to, FDR was to radio, JFK was to television, Donald Trump is to social media in a way. He's used it beautifully, whether you like it or not, he's the best troll around. He uses effectively to govern, to make announcements, to uh, undermine people, to attack. Today he was attacking uh, Justice Sotomayor. Um, and for this and, information. And, and, yes. and Justice Ginsburg, which is dangerous. Um, what, do you, what, is that, what, what responsibility do social media companies have to that? When you're doing your job, because you use it too, you're quite active. What, I, I, what do I you do imagine has happened to the news environment in that case? Let me put it this way, I've been doing the, the newscast with Univision for 33 years already. And I can assure you, Cara, that, that without presence in social media, I wouldn't have a job right now. Mm -hmm. Because now we're doing 
sometimes TV for people who don't even own a TV. Right. I'm also um, doing a, a program just, just for the internet mm -hmm. because people are somewhere else. It's, it's shifting. And, and by the way, some people in, 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 in TV right now, they're in complete denial. The same way that people in newspapers and magazines were 10 years ago, right. it's exactly what's happening with, with so TV So does right the now. newscast matter at all, like the idea of a newscast? The content matters. Okay. And, and the, but the way we approach it is completely different. Let's say 10, 15, 20 years ago, we were reporting facts and people were expecting the facts for the, for the newscast that day. Mm -hmm. Not anymore. I think everybody knows exactly what's happening right now. And when we come on the air at 6.30, they expect more, um, more analysis, more yeah. context. Right. And, and, and we expect, and they are expecting um, from us something different, to tell them the truth, the way we see it. Right. Especially when we have a president that is lying constantly. Again, uh, is that a confrontational position from a journalist? Well, that's, that's our responsibility. If we don't do it, nobody else is going to do it. It's, it's really interesting because I was just, I've been recently watching a lot of Edward R. Murrow stuff. Yeah. I just, for some reason, I've been looking at it. And he was quite confrontational, actually, in a lot of ways, especially for the day. Um, what, what then happens to the media environment? Because it becomes so fractured. There's so many voices and everybody does have a say, which is a good thing. But at the same time, the noise creates uh, dysfunction. It's, it's, um, it's amped up sort of engagement is enragement. And it creates this situation where nobody... Uh, knows what the truth is in, in it. Well, but at, at the same time, as, as it happened with Edgar Armoro and as it's happening with, with us right now, the, the most important thing that we have as journalists is our credibility. Mm -hmm. If what I say, um, if nobody cares about that, or if people think that I'm lying, then I'm, I'm done as a journalist. I, I, I wouldn't have a job. Let me give you an example. Every, every year here in Miami, we have hurricanes. Mm -hmm. And I've I personally, that. yeah, <laughs> and I've chosen two people from two local stations who are very good uh, because I, I trust what they say and my life and the life of my family and my home depends on what they say. Should I, should I leave my house? Should I go exactly. somewhere else? Mm -hmm. So that's exactly what we do in social media. Many people follow you mm -hmm. and they trust what you say. Hopefully many people follow me and they trust what I say. And that's exactly the same way as with Armoro. The only difference is that um, now instead of having two networks or three networks, ABC, NBC, and CBS as, as it was back then, uh, we have millions of networks of people using uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and that's a big difference. Where do you think it ends up as it moves forward? I mean, obviously, there's a lot of regulate people are looking at regulating some of these companies. Do you consider, um, given these platforms are so important, whether it's Twitter or Reddit or Facebook, Facebook's the biggest yeah. among them, um, where's the responsibility? Do you think there's a responsibility for, on these tech companies to, to act? Because just the other day, Mark Zuckerberg said, we're somewhere between a... Um, a telecom company and a publisher. And it reminded me of that old skit, I'm, I'm showing my age here, is it a dessert topping or a floor wax? Um, well, you know, if you remember from SNL. Um, what are they? I mean, because it's all the old people. Were well, like, uh -huh. they, are saying, they are saying that they are not a, um, a network. They, right. They're saying they're not a, they don't have a journalistic operation. Right, a publisher. So, but, but maybe, can I switch the question sure. and send it to you? So what would you do? Do you think they need to be regulated? Yes. And in which way, how? Well, I think if you look at the top 10 companies or the, the top companies right now are tech companies in terms of market valuation, maybe not in the market today, but, but, but because we've had a sell-off, but most of the, the economic growth has happened through tech uh, in, in the last 10 years, essentially. And a lot of the wealth creation, everything, the top 10 rich people are all tech people. Um, it's an industry unlike Wall Street or cars or pharmaceuticals uh, even if it's problematic regulation, they have regulation. There's not one. It, there's not one law on the books about internet companies at all. Not one. Um, and in fact, the one law that does exist is very advantageous toward them, which allows them to be immune from uh, any legal action. So, so what kind of would it be government regulation? I don't I mean, know. You wanna? You wanna? You want a big censor? No. No. 
So how would that work? I, well, it's an, it's, it's an honest question. I, I well, you, you are, Univision's responsible for the things that is on on your air. If you are you time, careless yeah. and the things you create cause havoc, you are you pay for it. And I think it's the responsibility. It's being legally liable for um, creating things either sloppily or um, with malintent or things. I like am that. responsible for what I do, and you are responsible for yeah. what I do. But how about if there's someone else who's posting? Mm -hmm. on your network, right. on your platform, right. uh, where is that responsibility? Well, the New York Times is actually responsible for those, too. So in, they, they're, they're abrogated around the comments, but at the same time, uh, on some level, they have to create tools where it can't, it can't be used for disinformation. They have to be more... It's, it's going to be incredibly complex to figure it out because they can sort of get out of it and at the same time have created the tools in such a sloppy way that... You know, you can look at any of the areas of the world. In Myanmar, they didn't have enough speakers. They didn't do this. They didn't do that. Um, they do things. I'll give you a good example, Facebook Live, for example. And I've told this story before, but um, when they created it, they bring in reporters to look at it before. And they're all excited, and they get all, they're like, literally, it's like 12-year-old boys all there going, look what I made. It's so cool. And I was in the room, and I said, okay, this is a live, you know, immediate live posting by anybody in the world can do this. And I said, what do you do if someone murders someone on this? What do you do if someone commits suicide? What do you do about bullies? What about child pornography, live child pornography? What about if a mass murderer puts a, puts a GoPro on the top of his head and starts broadcasting? And the person who was showing it to me said, you're such a bummer, Kara. And I was like, yeah, I am. That's me, you know. I have had some experience with the human race, and I've noticed they, when they get tools, they tend to like use them um, in, a, in a malevolent way sometimes. And it was, but the, and I was like, where are the safeguards that you're putting into place before? And and they were like, well, like they hadn't that part of it they hadn't thought of. Now that's changed obviously mm -hmm. when they create things now because of the experiences, but not because they had any, uh, they weren't sued for it. They were not. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't pay any price for the mistakes they made. And so I'm trying to figure out how you create a price um, for when you make shoddy products. Okay, Th that's, that's an, an interesting proposition. But as, as a journalist, right. we cannot just wait to see, well, let's see if they regulate them or not. Mm -hmm. Our responsibility is completely different. I right. think our responsibility would be to, um, to find facts, to confront those who are in right. power, and that's what we need to do. Right, absolutely. But I think one of the things is it has repercussions well beyond that. Like there was a really great series in the New York Times recently about uh, child pornography mm -hmm. on these sites, and the, the, the very little is being done to mitigate the problem. The, it, it, you can do that with addictiveness with teens. They very, know very well inside these companies how addictive these products are, um, akin to cigarettes, akin to other things still not doing anything about it, yet facilitating it. And so you have to sort of start to think they're not benign. And so if they're not benign, they're not making things of benign that affect people, there has to be some kind of regulation, smart regulation, that doesn't hinder innovation. And when they when they worried about hindering innovation, they tend to go to the China argument. Well, China. If we don't do something, China will beat us. If we don't do this, and we'll have, you know, they'll be running the internet in the next era. But for instance, let, let me just put it this way: What would happen in authoritarian governments? What would happen in China? What would happen in Saudi Arabia? What would happen in Cuba? Well, they're already it, doing it. Exactly. They're already using these tools. Exactly. But do we want to do that? No. 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 Of course not. But I, what I'm talking about is they tend to say that there can't be innovation without freedom for them, and in fact. When you have one or two or three companies, in this case, it would be Facebook, uh, Google. It really would be Facebook and Google, mm -hmm. essentially. Um, sort of buying up all the companies, uh, shutting down innovation. You don't get the kind of innovation needed to create new paradigms. So if we say, let, let's, on, on the political conversation, mm -hmm. how about if we know for, for a fact that a president or a candidate is lying right. and that he's buying uh, ads and publicity, should we stop them? Well, should we don't. We? Facebook doesn't. They made the decision not to. I mean, how do you feel about that? You're, you get, let's get back to politics. I mean, yeah. what, do you, what, do you, what does the political landscape look now? You well, have Bloomberg spending every, I'm going to say every dime he has because he's got a lot of dimes, um, but spending enormous amounts of money on social media, on Facebook. The Trump campaign, quite good at it. Brad Parcell is a genius at, at using social media. Um, it, what, should, what would you do if you were running Facebook? Or, or now Twitter decided to cut them off, say we're not going to have lies, we can't even figure it well, out. Well, I, I, I agree with you that, that in certain situations, child pornography you mentioned, for instance, mm -hmm. there has to be done. Mm -hmm. it has, there has to be something done. But my problem is with, with uh, political discourse. Mm -hmm. Are we going to start censoring political discourse, even if we don't want to? How about um, white nationalists? Mm -hmm. Should we stop that? 
Should we as, um, as co should companies stop that kind of um, information? They do sometimes. They do other times. They, my issue is that it's done in a haphazard way by mm -hmm. people who are not necessarily qualified. I would like elected officials and, and citizens to start talking about this as a larger thing rather than, um, say, in the case of Facebook, it's a company that is run by someone who cannot be fired ever. You know, he's, he's like a dictator of that company. Um, he's unfireable, he controls the board, he controls everything, and so do you want one person making decisions that affect lots of people? And it's something that everyone needs to think about at the very least. And, and I, I think this conversation is obviously is, is going to continue, but um, since I cannot do anything about it right now, mm -hmm. my responsibility, I'm, I'm just going back to my role as, yeah, as a journalist. Doing, yeah, we have, we have to, if someone is lying, we have to say it, if someone is, um, harming children, we have to say it, and if a president is lying, we have to say it. Except that when you get in a digital environment, it's different than a network. If there's a lie, a lie on a network, everyone sees it. In this case, they can send a million different lies to a million different people, mm -hmm. all geared toward that the, the information they've gleaned. Now, probably one of the great ways to solve this would be to have a really good privacy bill, to have to know about what happens to your data, to not be tracked the way you are, to be not micro-targeted. And so they can't send a million different lies to someone. Um, that's not even being done. There, there's no privacy bill in this country. We're the only country, uh, mm -hmm. it, it, there's a lot going on in Europe, there's a lot going on in, in Australia. We have a bill in California that's the de facto rule for this country, but there's not a national privacy bill to protect your so, privacy. So the two most important things that you would do is regulations on content, and uh, then on privacy. No, privacy. Privacy starts, this privacy and data starts to take care of the rest of it, I think. Yeah, and, and I don't want them to use my, my information, and I, I, but they I agree do. with you completely. They do, right. all the time. Yeah. Not me today, because I don't have a phone, but right now, <laughs> if um, I sign off of everything, actually, but, but, but and it, even signed off, they ping you hundreds of times um, and know everything about you without your consent. And it's interesting, we were having a conversation bec before we started, and, and we were saying, uh, well, this is not off the record. Well, the fact is that um, I'm assuming, uh, as you are, that mm -hmm. everything that I, that I say on this phone is being tracked and that right. somebody is listening or reading yes, it. Yes, they are, in fact. Yeah, so that's the, way, that's the way of the record doesn't exist anymore. Everything is public. Okay, let's talk a little bit about covering yeah. uh, this election. How yeah. do you look forward to it? And, 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 and I do want to talk a little bit about immigration and where you think we are in it, because that story, one of the problems of this new news environment we're in mm. is it's very twitchy, it's very quick, and people move on from the next thing. And so uh, this week we're talking about this, then we're talking about this, and oh yeah, impeachment, that seemed like six years mm. ago, impeachment. Um, and now we're, now we're in the, I guess, the Bernie Sanders phase of the discussion. Um, but it goes from one thing to the other. Immigration really has gotten lost as a discussion. Um, not necessarily. The, the way I see it, the, the big picture, the way I see it here in the United States, we're having four major changes. One has to do with climate change. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's, another, that's another issue. Another has to do with... Um, technological revolution that we just, that we just mm -hmm. discussed. Another incredibly important um, has to do with the Me Too movement mm -hmm. and the fight for equality in this country. And then the last one, the last change, is what I call the Latino wave. Mm -hmm. in, in 2044, everyone in this country, everyone is going to be a minority. Mm -hmm. And that's a major change. That's, in, that's an incredible demographic revolution that we're seeing right now. Latinos will go from 60 million to more than 100 million. And nobody is going to be able to make it to the White House or any position of power without the Latino vote. That's, that's what's happening. And in this election, for instance, for the first time, the Latino vote um, is going to be larger than the African-American vote. In other words, there's going to be more Latinos eligible to vote than, than African-Americans. And we've been discussing the 2016 election and what happened in, in Pennsylvania and Wisconsin and Michigan. Well, the truth is that maybe the election was not decided there. Maybe it was decided here in Florida mm -hmm. and it was decided in Arizona. With the electoral votes in, in Florida, 29, and the 11 electoral votes in Arizona, it would have been a completely different issue. And everything has to do also with, with immigration. What we are seeing is that the country is being transformed and we have someone in the White House right now uh, thinking that the way the country should look is in the 1920s or in the 1930s. So how do you cover that? What do you, how, when you're thinking about covering this, how do you assess how the networks are covering the elections, how they're, how, what should be covered? If you could change it in any way, what, would you, what do you think is the critical we, way to cover this? I, I think 
we are giving voice to people who don't have a voice. When was the last time that you saw on ABC, NBC, CBS, or CNN, or Fox News an undocumented immigrant? Mm -hmm. Very rarely. And we do that all the time. The fact is that we have 10 million people in this country uh, who are not criminals or terrorists or rapists, uh, who are contributing to the economy, and we have to do something about it. So that's the first approach. We are giving, for many people, they are invisible. And our job, my job, is to make them visible and to making sure that whatever they are feeling and whatever they have to say is being transmitted to the candidates, for instance. So um, we are asking the candidates, would you stop all deportations? Mm -hmm. would, you, would you be willing to legalize 10 million undocumented immigrants? That's what we are asking. And those are kinds of questions that you don't hear in other networks. What do you imagine, but it, it did get a lot of coverage for a short time, how do you keep that going in terms of if it's not done in sort of this build a wall way where it's dramatic, is a lot of the coverage around it is very dramatic, is the wall gonna get built, and your yeah. piece in the Times was Trump is the, is Trump is the wall? Uh, Explain that for people. Well, the, and now Mexico is the wall. Right. Yeah, uh, as you know, Donald Trump said that Mexico was gonna pay for the wall, so what happened is that he hasn't been able to build anything at all uh, at the border in Mexico is not paying for the wall. However, um, there's a new agreement between Mexico and the United States. It, it's called um, Remain in Mexico program. So people from Central America, instead of applying for asylum in the United States, they're staying on the Mexican side. So here you have 50,000 Central Americans waiting on the Mexican side. And also the new National Guard created by uh, President uh, Lopez Obrador is helping Donald Trump by stopping Central Americans crossing their southern border. Mm -hmm. So Mexico, in reality, has become Trump's wall. Mm -hmm. And the new National Guard in Mexico um, is becoming, actually, the new immigration police for Donald Trump. So how do you get, where do you imagine this is gonna end up if he wins again and if he doesn't? What happens? What, what Donald Trump has done is um, more than deporting undocumented immigrants, because uh, Barack Obama deported more immigrants than, than Donald Trump has done so far. Um, he has been successful at stopping immigrants from coming in uh, with visa programs, well, banning uh, people from certain countries from, from coming in, mm -hmm. and even stopping legal immigration. Every single year we used to have about a, a million legal immigrants, legal immigrants coming in, and now that number has gone down to about 600,000. Mm -hmm. so, he has been successful at stopping immigrants from coming in and by creating fear in other countries that if you try to get into the United States, something terrible is going to happen to you. And something terrible is going to happen to you if you try to cross from, from Matamoros to Brownsville and then you see people from the cartels uh, trying to kidnap you or asking you for, for money to, to come into the United States. What is the ultimate impact on this country of that? Um, and, you know, I write about it from Silicon Valley's sure. perspective, is they're not getting as many, a lot of innovation is going elsewhere across the world. Immigration's been a critical part of the building of Silicon Valley, and most of the CEOs are immigrants. Yeah. Uh, Elon Musk, Sachin Nadella, Sundar Pichai, uh, each of them, so I could name dozens and dozens. The, Donald Trump is trying to revert the demographic revolution that we are seeing in this country. Again, l l just remember, in 2044, everyone is going to be a minority. And that's the kind of America that Donald Trump doesn't want. So he's trying to revert that, but, but it's almost impossible. It was in, in June 2015, he announced that he wanted to be, be president. But then, so interesting, in July 2015, Already the majority of the babies being born in the United States were coming from minority families. So the change is unavoidable, it's unstoppable. He cannot, he cannot really stop it, but he's really trying and trying hard. So what other things are you looking at in the election on the Democratic side? This has been quite a unusual. What, what, I, what, I'm, what I'm seeing is that the so-called resistance mm -hmm. or the rebellion to, to Donald Trump mm -hmm. uh, somehow is working. What we don't know if this rebellion is going to be enough, big enough, to avoid the re-election of Donald Trump. That's, that's the way I'm seeing it. So you don't know where in the Star Wars saga we are? Where we could we're be. right in the middle. We're right now. We're so that's right. Empire Strikes Back. Yeah, well, there you go. We're right, that right, wasn't good. That was no, no. Well, we're right in the middle. Uh -huh. But you live in California. How do you see it? 
Um, Where are we? I, I don't know. I, I think everyone's confused. I think I'm the, I was telling uh, the driver who drove me in today, I'm the only person we were, he was asking about homelessness in, in San Francisco, and I said it's been politicized. It's not as bad as it looks, and it's, mm -hmm. there's a lot of really important trends that are happening there, including housing prices, including um, having a more tolerant uh, feelings towards poor people than other states. Um, and, and California is like an island yes, sometimes, isn't yes, it? Yes, exactly. And I was there in Los Angeles yesterday, and it feels completely different than the rest of the country. It does. Um, and so we were discussing that, and one of the things uh, he was asking about was, what did I think of Bernie Sanders? It was really interesting. Uh -huh. and, I, and I was like, I do not know what to think of Bernie Sanders. I'll be honest with you, I don't. And then a friend of mine who was a Sanders person said, it's a short jump from disliking him to liking him, which I thought was... Okay, all right, okay. And it was interesting. And then my third experience was my mom, who was just stays down here in Florida and stuff, and she goes from, I, I, she's a Fox News watcher, so that's all I need to say, um, an elderly Fox News watcher, mm -hmm. so you can imagine what's happening there for, to her brain. Um, uh, <laughs> I told her when she dies, I'm going to have her brain looked at, and okay. like for FTE, um, so Fox uh, trauma. Um, and uh, but anyway, she she called me and she goes, I really like what Bernie is saying, and I'm like, what? Like, because she was sort of Trumpy, but not. She doesn't like Trump because she thinks he's gross, and then at the same time, she likes the tax cut, things like that. And so I don't know. That's my answer. Well, the, the um, I know California is not voting for Donald Trump, but otherwise, I don't know what. To wh say. What I'm seeing is that the country is, is more divided than than ever before. But is it? I think so. absolutely, absolutely. I mean, uh, even in I'm, I'm sure you're having the, sometimes the same problem when you are with friends or family. Sometimes you have to avoid Trump and you have to avoid that conversation because otherwise, it's dividing families and it's dividing groups. Um, l let me give you an example when. In, in 2016, where I work here in, in, in Doral, uh, when you come into the, the network, on the left side is the TV side, and on the right side is the, is the radio mm -hmm. side. And I pass through the radio side uh, all the time. And I used to listen to people calling and saying, well, I'm going to vote for Donald Trump. And, and back then, for many Latinos, many Latinos didn't feel comfortable saying that they were going to vote for Donald Trump because mm -hmm. of the sexist remarks that he had made to um, access Hollywood and because of the racist remarks that he had made against uh, immigrants. But still, I was listening to people calling in and saying, yes, I'm, I'm, I sort of like Donald Trump. Well, I should have stopped and, and listened carefully because um, we made a mistake. We, we didn't see this wave that was happening in this country, this resentment that was happening in this country. And 29% of Latinos voted for Donald Trump. And what I'm seeing right now in 2020 is that those who were uncomfortable saying that they were gonna vote, I'm talking about Latino voters, that, that they felt uncomfortable saying that they were gonna vote for Donald Trump, mm -hmm. now they feel sort of vindicated and they feel more comfortable saying, yes, I'm gonna be voting for Donald Trump. So the fact is, if within the, Lat the Latino community, more than 29% of Latinos will vote for Donald Trump. And, and according to history, if the Republican candidate gets more than a third of the Hispanic vote, he usually wins. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's where we are right now. Now, the question is, if you voted for Donald Trump, are you a racist? If you voted for Donald Trump, are you a sexist? Well, many people are putting those questions aside. And many people are thinking, well, maybe the economy is more important. Maybe... Cuba is more important. Maybe Venezuela is more important. Mm -hmm. So something that ethically might not be acceptable as defending a racist suddenly becomes um, acceptable if the economy or Cuba or Venezuela or Nicaragua becomes more important. So how, what is the impact of the comments Bernie Sanders made then uh, about uh, Castro um, just the other night? I, I've been living here in, in Miami for, for quite a long time. And um, many, Florida might be gone if the vote depends on that. You, you cannot, say, let, let me just say it clearly, uh, Cuba is a dictatorship. It's been a dictatorship since 1959. Mm -hmm. Venezuela is a dictatorship. Nicaragua is a dictatorship. And, and that's where you have to start. You cannot start by saying, well, maybe they have a great health program, or maybe they have an education. Right. If they kill thousands of people in Cuba, if they have political prisoners, uh, if they don't have opposition parties, um, that cannot be a democracy. And, and you cannot tell that to people who personally suffered 
from dictatorships. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be incredibly difficult. Mm -hmm. So damaging is what you're saying. It is very damaging. And, and as, as journalists, again, we, we can go back to the beginning of the conversation. It is our responsibility to question those who are in power. So what question would you ask Bernie Sanders now, if you were sitting across from him? It wasn't Anderson. Uh, well, as a matter of fact, I'm going to have, have that opportunity in the debate on, on oh, March right. 15th. Right, in, that's right. Yeah, in, in Phoenix, Arizona. So Do you want to give us a preview? Sure. The question would be, no, I can't. Yes, yes. <laughs> Come on. No, I can't. I, I thought I really everything can't. was on the record. What the heck? No, no, everything's on the record, but um, no, I can't. You can't. <laughs> No, th this is, it, it would be unfair for him and it would be unfair for all the, for the, the other candidates. But so it will be something around that topic. It would be a question, yes. All right, excellent. <laughs> um, so I want to finish up and then we'll get some questions from the sure. audience. Um, when you think about, you know, your career, mm -hmm. if you were to start it right now, right now, mm -hmm. um, what would you do? Where would you work? Not where, not, not in a network, not, not in a TV network, uh, because our job is disappearing. I remember when I started uh, my career, I, I was 28, uh, I was an anchor. Um, it was not because I was the, the best or the worst, I was the only one in the network. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so they put me for a month, and then it was two months, three months, and it's been 33 years. But uh, everybody wanted to be an anchor, I remember. Everybody wanted to be Peter Jennings. Yeah, I see your name says anchor up there, but go ahead. Exactly, well, okay. that, that's wrong. Because okay. nowadays you have to be everything but an anchor. You have to be able to move from one platform to the other. You have to be able to survive um, in social media. Uh, you, have to, um, you have to be anything but an anchor. Anchor is not good. All right, <laughs> so what would you be? Well, not an anchor is not a job. No, but, but, but simply, uh, simply a, a, a great journalist. I, I wanted to show you, that's why I brought this. I mean, you would never, when was the last time you read a, a paper like this? 1994. <laughs> okay, well, but two great journalists. Right, um, Jody and Megan. Exactly. Yeah. And have, could you ever imagine a, few, a couple of years ago, Weinstein guilty? Those are good journalists. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I was writing uh, Jody uh, this morning. Yeah. Um, I was texting with her, and I said you should. Um, I said uh, most of the credit should go to the women who came forward and testified against him, and the stories like Ashley Judd and others. But you have to take a moment to understand your impact. And I, uh, I thanked her. I said thank you for my kids. I have two sons and a daughter, and I said thank you for my daughter, but really thank you for my sons. And and let me let me just say about that the impact that he's having worldwide. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's what we're doing on Univision. We're trying to approach stories in a, in a different way. And for instance, in, in Mexico right now, I don't know if you're aware, but on March the 9th, uh, there's a, a huge, incredibly important protest movement. Mm -hmm. And on March the 9th, all women in Mexico have decided um, not to go, not to be public, not to go to work, not to go to colleges, not to buy anything. So it's gonna be a day without women in order for Mexicans, for Mexico to realize their importance. And, and it's a protest against, against the macho culture in Mexico. To put it in context, in the last year, in 2019, more than 34,000 people have been killed. And, and more than 1,000 women were killed just because they were women, mm -hmm. just because of that. Something has to be done. Uh, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador hasn't been able to put a stop to that. So the impact of the Me Too movement here in the United States, mm -hmm. just imagine, it it's going to be an incredible scene uh, to go to Mexico, and then suddenly all the women as protests deciding, today, you don't count with me. Which was also a, a social media campaign, too, Me yeah. Too. A lot of the stories started to begin to bubble up, and people began to get brave around it. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's been a, a backlash just the same way, uh, but although this is a, a great victory. Um, when you think about um, what's really happening, let's finish up talking about journalism to journalism right now. Uh, and that's sort of like one of those journalism conference questions. Mm -hmm. um, but what do you imagine? I feel very bullish about journalism. I do not feel everyone's sort of like, oh, we're being attacked, which we always were. And I'm, okay. I'm reading right now, um, 
the, the, the Ron Chernow book about Hamilton. I've been reading it for four years now. Um, <laughs> I, I am. I literally pick it up. I read four pages. I put it down. And I'm like, I'm only on page 604. Uh, but uh, on page 604, it's all about his use of uh, media and, the, and, the, and media at the time um, under assumed names. He wrote under all these uh, unusual names uh, to go back and forth. And it was a really, it was a really ugly time politically. It was an ugly time from a media point of view. Um, I was reading about, um, I'm going to, Calendar, James Calendar, the one who, who was uh, used by Thomas Jefferson to attack. Um, it, it's the sa it was the same. It was, as I'm reading it, you know, in, in this fourth year now, um, it's the same thing that's happened. So I'm very positive. I think this is not a new thing, that this has been the same way. For and, and it is, um, I think it's a great time and a, a very important time to be a journalist. So what do you, th what, any advice for this group of people here gathered? And then we're going to ask questions. Well, Again, our job is to confront those who are in power. Right. Of course, report reality as it is, please, and, and be, be careful, be very careful. But then, especially in moments like this, when we have a president like this, when we have still dictatorships in Cuba, in Venezuela, in Nicaragua, uh, when we have um, women being killed in Mexico, our responsibility is to ask the tough questions. And if we don't do that, then nobody else is going to do it. That's what we do to ask top questions. All right, questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. We have one over here, and I'll take this one first because I'm closer, but the, stand up please, it'll yes. be easier, thank you. Hi, Rasan Harris from the Emma Bowen Foundation. Hi. Um, thank you for sharing. I'm really interested about covering the Latinx community. As you were saying, almost 30% of Latinos would vote for Trump. And so if you don't come from the Latino community and you try and report on Latinos and their perspectives towards the election. How do folks outside the community try to wrap their arms around the diversity within the Latino community and understand the implication for, for example, the US election? I, I think if um, the easiest way to explain that, just try to go from the, the traditional term of Latino to the new term Latinx that, that you just mentioned. And then with the term Latinx, Many people don't feel very comfortable yet with it, but it's much more inclusive. It includes everybody. It includes uh, groups that in the past were not uh, considered Latinos or were not giving um, enough credit. And if you understand that we are not monolithic, yeah. that, uh, that we are incredibly diverse, that we are very young, that we use social media more than anybody else, that we are connected to our phones, um, and that when I got here to the United States in uh, 1983, it was so easy. You, you were saying, oh, Latinos, yes, Cubans, Puerto Ricans, and Mexicans, that's it, next. Mm -hmm. Now, it is not. It is very, very different. We, we um, uh, second and third generation Latinos tend to marry outside the, the Latino community. Um, my son, Nicolas, without the age, uh, he's Porto, Cuban, Mexican, American. Uh, and he feels more comfortable with football than with soccer. In other words, we are very, very diverse and don't think of us as a, as a monolithic structure. Yeah, that's something that media had tended to do is monolithic, uh, looking at all groups, whether it's African Americans or gays or, or anyone else. Uh, you know, I was thinking about that the other day when they were covering um, the guy, the NSC guy who's completely unqualified for the job, Richard Grinnell, and I was thinking, I have nothing to do with that gay guy, and I'm gay. <laughs> like, like, we have, we're, you know, and, and, mm -hmm. and they were covering it, they were covering the gay aspects of him, and I was sort of like, mm, that has nothing to do with it. And, and so, so, yeah, I would say, uh, be, pay attention to what we have to say. Pay attention to those who don't have a voice. Yeah. Uh, because when you talk about the Latino community, it's just those who can talk on MSNBC and CNN. But the fact is that, uh, there are many voices that are out there and that we are simply not listening to. And, and, and the future is there. Uh, I, Cesar Chavez used to say uh, in 1984 in, in, in San Francisco, he, he once said, uh, we've looked into the future and the future is ours. It's just the numbers. For the first time in the Latino community, we're going from big numbers to a little power and it feels great, but still we are underrepresented. We only have four senators, we are about 20% of the population, and it, so our role as journalists is, is different. My, my role as a journalist is not only the, the role that you would expect for another anchor in another network. Um, it's not only to give information, but also sometimes to take a stand. And I know it might be controversial, but that's the way it is. 
We have four questions okay. and we may only have time for three, okay. but go, right. please. Hi, my name is Alice Sinishan. I'm with the Blandon Foundation in Northern Minnesota. So exactly to my question, what do we all need to do to make sure that we have a full and fair 2020 census? Well, yeah, we didn't talk about the census. You wanna go ahead? Uh, Wow, it's, you know, it's all about data as usual, you know, and the ability of people to give accurate data because so much is based on it. Um, in some ways, I think that te tech companies should be doing the census because they already know everything about everybody and know where they move. Um, uh, so it's, I think it's going to be critical, the ability to screw with two things, voting, rec people are talking about voting machines, also voting databases are more at risk. Um, the ability to change an address slightly um, and then you can't vote. The ability to, to suppress votes, I think, is really much more at risk than people realize they're focused only on the machines, which also need to be you know, secured and backed up and, and, and using this technology that's super interesting called paper. Um, but, uh, but I think that the, the census is the same thing. It's a data play and it's, a, it's gonna be open to so much abuse and you're already seeing that. Um, I'm not, it, it, it requires that we have a functioning Senate, for example, to pass these security laws and these privacy laws um, in order to be able to do it right. So I, I am slightly worried about the abuses of the data that's collected and then the fear of people of giving up data, although they do it every day. Um, so I think it's going to be, a, it's one of the biggest stories, I think. Yeah, and for, for the Latino community, it, it is very important for us that we are being counted because we're growing. And if we grow more, then it's going to be, we have, we have more power. We don't have that power yet. Again, four senators cannot represent the, the 60 million Latinos. And then when you, when you tell an immigrant, don't worry, just answer the questions on the census. Nobody is going to do anything again. Well, yeah. um, can we trust the government? I mean, can they trust the Trump administration? That's, that's, a, that's a difficult part. And they've just put a fear in it. There's enough fear there so that people won't. Already there's a, a lot of fear right now. Yeah, so I guess we'll just have Facebook do it. Um, we have a question right here. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, John Rudolph from Feet and Two Worlds. Thank you for a very interesting conversation. I want to go back to the story you told at the beginning about Donald Trump tweeting out your private phone number and ask what guidelines you would suggest for covering something like that. You talked about the need to provide context, so, uh, and we see lots of reports now um, where uh, tweets by uh, important people are, are included in the news coverage, mm -hmm. um, but there isn't a lot of context around them, so uh, how, how would you cover that incident today? And, and provide the appropriate context. The, this, is, this is what happened when I, when I was in that press conference and when I got ejected by a, by a bodyguard, taller than me, well, everyone's taller than me. <laughs> um, only two reporters, Casey Hunt from MSNBC and Tom Yamas, they stood up and they told uh, Donald Trump, you cannot do that. And thanks to them, I was able to go back to the press conference and then ask my questions. Nobody knows that I came back and I had seven minutes with, with Donald Trump, back and forth. Um, but all the other reporters, they stay silent. I, I bet that today it would be different. I bet that today would be many, many more Tom Yamas asking the questions and confronting President Trump. Um, and this is not a profession for people who want to be silent. If you want to be silent, you've got to choose something else. I am always amazed by silence sometimes from reporters. It's fascinating, but in this case, it's not anymore. Everybody, the sort of the lid is we off. Can, this is not a time to be silent. Um, we, if you want to be silent, you've got to do something else, but this is not a time to be silent. And I know it's, it's not easy, but the more power they have, the more, the tougher that we have to get as journalists. And one of the things, access journalism, I think, is over. The idea oh, yeah. that you get anything from access is, um, you know, one time the head of Uber is like, um, you're, we're not going to be talking to you. And I go, oh, fine, good. Uh-oh, not that. And, of course, he's gone and I'm still there. But, I mean, it's just you don't need it anymore. And I think journalists have been trading access for uh, sh shitty coverage for so long. It's and and I, have a, I have a rule usually with people with a lot of power. Um, I have two things in mind. The first is that if I don't ask the question, nobody else is going to do it. Obviously, that's, that's not true, but that's the attitude that I have. Um, and the second one is that I'm always assuming that I will never talk to that person again. And if you think of that, yeah. then, 
then it's going to be a, a different, it's going to be a, a completely different interview. They I'll also end up talking to you more, which is interesting. <laughs> yes. um, Mark Andreessen used to say that someone asked him why people keep talking to me in Silicon Valley, and he said it was Stockholm syndrome. <laughs> but they do. If you, the, once you become an access journalist, you get. They're the, afraid of they're, you. I've been reading. Right, apparently. We have a yes. question back I'm, here and uh, one final. Hi, uh, Sarah Bartlett with the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism. Jorge, okay. can you tell us what's going to happen now that Univision has been sold or is in the process of being sold? What, what's the outlook for the kind of journalism that you and your colleagues are doing there? And explain the Well, sale. yes, uh, just this morning it was announced that um, two companies are buying um, Univision, 64% of the company, and I think they're buying into a great company. I, we are the leaders in the Hispanic market. We have a great news department. We're doing things that nobody else is doing. I think they, they were listening to, um, to all the people that are saying that the future is Latino. Um, again, uh, I think that when, when I see it 30 years ago, nobody paid attention to who, who we were. Uh, I, I used to work for the SIN network, Spanish International Network, not exactly the best, the best name. Um, <laughs> it's and, a great name. And we, yeah. Great name. What's yeah. wrong with that name? Yeah, I work for the SIN network. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's good. Well, not, a, not anymore. Um, and now we are fully part of the, of the American experience. And we participated, for instance, in this uh, electoral campaign in, in two debates. Um, in many forums. In other words, people do understand that without Latinos, um, it is impossible to make it to the White House. And to be part of that, of a company that, that led the way is just fantastic. I you're think gonna, they're buying into a great house. you're going to see lots of different ownership structures going forward, whether it's Bezos buying the Washington Post and largely leaving it alone. I think he's been a pretty good owner. Other thing, he has other issues, but that one he's done a good and, job. And the growth see is, a lot of different. Changes. And the growth is there again. 60 million Latinos right now. In 30 years, 100 million Latinos. Uh, we're buying a lot of stuff. We're using phones. Uh, we're consuming. We're traveling. Um, I think it's a great business. All right, you're doing over here. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Jorge. You, you just mentioned you can't get to the White House without the, the Latino vote. Uh, every election cycle, there's always the question, is this the year Hispanics are finally the decisive force that they need to be? I want to ask the question just a little bit differently, though. I, I'm from El Paso, uh, and so I'm just wondering, with the experience in El Paso last summer, uh, where Hispanics were targeted by a domestic terrorist, uh, uh, by somebody using rhetoric that's also coming from the White House and media sources, does that realization activate more Hispanic voters? Uh, are, uh, that, that physical threat to them and their children, is, is that finally sort of what pushes things over, over the top? I, I, I wish I'd, I, I would know the answer. I, I would say that for many people, they feel threatened, uh, they feel attacked, and that they're reacting to that. And, and some of the comments are directly related to, to President Trump. But on the other hand, I'm seeing many Latinos, again, as I just mentioned, that are openly telling us, I feel comfortable with Donald Trump. So I, I honestly don't know how the Latino community is going to react. Again, in 2016, 29% of Latinos voted for Donald Trump. I don't know if that number is gonna go up or not. But I think we, as, as the rest of the country, uh, the Latino community is divided in, in the division um, is called Donald Trump. All right, I have one last question. Um, if you had to name one thing you're most scared of for media uh, and, and your profession and our profession, uh, what would that be? And what would be the thing you're most heartened by? What is the thing that gives you the most optimism? I, I, I hate it when, when a reporter or a moderator has the opportunity to ask a tough question and he or she refrains from doing that. Uh, and, and I know how it feels, because when you, when you are with someone in, in power, mm -hmm. uh, and then you notice immediately, your hands start sweating, and you're thinking, oh, should I ask that question or not? Well, that's exactly the question that you, that you have to ask. So I'm, I'm very saddened and sorry when I see a journalist that has the opportunity to ask a tough question, a difficult question, and then they don't ask it. And then the, the most, the greatest thing that I'm seeing is a new generation who's unafraid, um, who's in, in your face, and going with, with a cell phone asking questions. That's the most beautiful thing that I've seen. All right. 
everybody. Thank you. Cara, thank you. Thank you.